But um, uh, also, if you get a chance, I know some, one of the groups met in the fort. And um, uh, you should go out and see the fort. It's quite kind of, kind of a remarkable thing. But the door is, not, is locked. Which one? Uh, when you gate? try to come back in from the fort, you can't get in. Oh, yeah, there's a little, well, there's a little brick or stone okay. near the door, <laughs> so, so you, you can know. walk around. It's not, it's not bad today. It would be, you know, in the rain or whatever. But, um, so, so, yeah, try to go up and see the fort if you can. It's worth seeing. Um, now, uh, also in your packet is an outline of Robert Miller's talk that he's going to be giving this afternoon. Uh, it's uh, 10 elements of the doctrine of discovery that I find very useful. So, so we're, we're very happy to have um, Robert Miller uh, Skyping in with us today. Um, um, he's um, a faculty director of the Rosette American Indian Economic Development Program, um, Sandra Day O'Connor, College of Law at Arizona State University. And, um, and uh, he's written extensively on the doctrine of discovery. Um, and he's actually been to Syracuse once before, a few years ago, and spoke at Lemoyne. It was a very good occasion. Um, he's also been doing, and I hope we, we talked about the possibility of him speaking about this today, too. He's done work on the international dimensions on the doc of the doctrine of discovery and the, ram the international ramifications of uh, Johnson v. McIntosh. So um, we could, you know, he could speak on a, a number of different topics. So I'm uh, very happy. And uh, I'll let you take it away, um, Robert. Okay? Of the doctrine of discovery by Spain and most of the New World, 
And the article that I wrote, you see is cited at the bottom. I wrote it with a Chilean professor and, and someone who's copies of both the United States and Chile. So we analyzed how Spain used the doctrine of discovery in Chile. And then I wrote an article with a Brazilian woman about how Portugal used the doctrine of discovery in Brazil. And one of my other books I wrote with indigenous professors from New Zealand, Australia, and Canada, and we compared how our four countries applied the doctrine of discovery to the indigenous peoples of those four countries. So Johnson is an enormously important case because it is cited by the courts of Australia, Canada, New Zealand. It was cited by the English Privy Council three times in cases regarding Africa. So these ideas of what today we call the doctrine of discovery were used around the world as European and American, Euro-American countries. It didn't colonize the indigenous peoples, pure and simple. So when we then talk about what we can do about it, this is what I'm going to talk about now, breaking this down into the 10 elements that I think Johnson v. McIntosh shows clearly the United States Supreme Court, what was it talking about? What happened due to colonization? What justified it? And what laws and principles came about because of it? And so then, in, in your discussions about how we might fight to resist the doctrine of discovery, to reverse the doctrine of discovery, what we're really talking about is what sorts of laws in the United States and elsewhere, and what sort of policies in the United States and elsewhere are still being practiced today that come directly from colonialism, directly from the religious background of the doctrine of discovery, and from Johnson v. McIntosh. So I think that's what I'll talk about. And if we can handle any questions across the country, I'd be happy to try to take them at the end. But I'm going to talk fairly briefly about these 10 elements. And what I'm telling you once again is in all this other work that I've done, I and my co-authors have used these 10 elements to compare how Spain, Portugal, England, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the United States have applied what we call today the doctrine of discovery to indigenous peoples. And, and also, before I forget, all those articles that I have written are available online for free. I give you the quote at the bottom of that page. The books are the course you have to buy. But if you want to read the articles that we've written, it's very easy to go to that web page I give you. You have to sign up. It takes 10 seconds, and it's free. And then you will have access to hundreds of thousands of articles on it from all sorts of authors around the world on all sorts of issues. OK, well, let's talk. Johnson v. McIntosh, the race to around the world by, by Europeans, and this idea of sticking your flag and sticking the cross in land when they went ashore, what were they doing? In the, in the paintings and, and, and what you read about explorers, they always say, oh, they were thanking God for a safe voyage and that they found land. <laughs> well, they were doing far more than that, folks. They were engaged in legal claims validified by the church. Places that European countries arrived first, they claimed various legal rights. And so when they went ashore, first discovery was very crucial to a claim by a country to newly discovered lands. So when Columbus and all these other explorers went ashore, there with the flag, there with the cross, many times they would say the mass, many times they would cut crosses on rocks, they would cut crosses on the, in the ground, in the grass. Spanish explorers were still doing this up the west coast of the United States, folks, and in BC and Alaska in the 1790s. So these formalities, these legal proceedings to try to prove where a European country had been first continued well into the 19th century. I just wrote a book chapter about Captain James Cook in Alaska in 1778. Three separate times he is going ashore, engaging in these kind of activities, claiming the land for the English king, and he even put British coins in glass jars and buried the coins. So he was trying to prove where he had been. And in fact, mapping, which was really a Dutch idea, I believe, as they were exploring the world, but to map where you have been, prove where you have been. And the naming of mountains, and the naming of rivers, and of islands, this was all a part 
of proving where you have been and claiming first discovery. Lewis and Clark, folks, how many of you know that they crossed the continent with a branding iron? The very you, the branding iron said, U period, S period, C A P T period, Gary Lewis. Mary Rebel Lewis. They barely mention the branding iron in the Lewis and Clark journals across the Rocky Mountains and get out here where I am now, the Pacific Northwest, the Oregon country. Now they use that branding iron 10 or 12 times. It's mentioned in the journals. Meriwether Lewis would brand a tree or brand a sandstone cliff, and Captain, Lewis, Captain William Clark and the men would carve their names with their knives. Now, were they just putting graffiti on the landscape? Of course not. They were trying to strengthen the United States' claim of first discovery and ownership of the Pacific Northwest. Thomas Jefferson was fully cognizant of this legal principle. Our founding fathers called it preemption, which you'll see is my element number three. And in fact, I guess we better get to these elements, else I'm never going to get done in half an hour, am I? So, first discovery. We've already mentioned it, and I have a two sentence description here. So, the race was on around the world. But Elizabeth I, Queen Elizabeth I, in the 1570s and 1580s, she developed the idea of this element number two. European country had showed up somewhere 50 years before and stuck their flag and cross in the soil. They couldn't claim the lands forever. And so what her, Elizabeth, her grandfather, and then her successor, when they chartered expeditions to North America, they used the phrase, go where no Christian prince has yet been, and acquire for me sovereignty, jurisdiction, and title. So European countries were seeking title to land, sovereignty and jurisdiction over people, and of course the ownership of any valuable assets they could find. But Elizabeth started this second idea. We don't care where Spain and Portugal have been, but if you haven't settled the location, we, the English, will claim it for our own. So as I told you in my notes there, first discovery gave the European power an incomplete claim to the land. To solidify that claim in the eyes of international law, the European country had to also occupy And you did that usually by building a post, a fort, or a little town and meeting some settlers there. Now, the third element that I have there, this is what our founding fathers called the doctrine of discovery. In fact, one of the very first laws under the Constitution we live under now, the Congress we're in now, what is it, the 113th Congress? Well, the very first Congress, in the very first internet Indian laws that they passed, July 22, 1790, Congress number one passes a law that is still on the books today, and they use the word preemption in the law. So this is the phrase that George Washington, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, and then our founding fathers, this is the right that they thought they had acquired from England. And this is still the law in the United States today and around most of the world when it comes to indigenous peoples. The existing government, the United States, and this is what Mississippi McIntosh says, the discovering power acquired the ultimate title. That's the phrase from Johnson B. McIntosh. When Europeans walked ashore and stuck their flag and their cross in the soil, something magically happened in the law. And the country, the discovering European country, claimed some sort of property right over the indigenous peoples. And they came to call that preemption. Mm -hmm. And when our founding fathers put that word preemption, that first Congress enacted that law July 22, 1790, they used the word preemption. They knew the rights they were claiming over the Indian peoples of North America. And I mean, I will read that to you, but the right that an the discovering country alleged was that the tribes now lost the full ownership of the land. Magically, just because a European walked ashore with a cross and a flag, or Captain James Cook planted some English coins uh, up in modern day Alaska. What the claim was is now the indigenous peoples could not sell their land to anyone but the country that had discovered. So walking ashore was of great value, 
Usually when I give my long talk, I pick someone in the front row. I see the guy with glasses there in the front row. I'm going to come over to your house. Yes, I'm coming to your house tonight. <laughs> I'm going to plant the Bob Miller flag and the Bob Miller religious symbol, and I'm going to claim that I have the ultimate title to your house. Or I'll let you live there. I'll let you use it, but it really belongs to me. That is what the doctrine of discovery means when we're talking land. And that's what the word preemption means. Thomas Jefferson included this idea in many meetings that he signed with tribes. He told tribal leaders this face to face in the White House, and he even wrote a letter to a particular tribal leader saying the same things. Your lands are yours, you can live on them forever, but if you ever choose to sell, you can only sell to the United States. You cannot sell to any other foreign country. You cannot sell to any individual. So this claim of preemption was a little property right, folks. And that's what Europeans and then later Americans were claiming under the doctrine of this government. And if you know anything about Indian country, you will know that this is still the law today. That law that I've mentioned twice that was enacted July 22, 1790, is still the law. You can find it at Here's the citation, 25 U.S.C. section 177. No tribe or Indian or band or nation of Indians can sell their land, dot, 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 I'm paraphrasing now, but without the permission of the United States. Indian tribes and Indian peoples cannot mortgage their own lands within reservations without the permission of the United States because the United States is still today deemed to be the legal owner of tribes Yeah, 
corporations around the entire world. In fact, the doctrine of discovery, folks, is one of the very earliest forms of international law. The law of the sea, the right to travel on the open ocean, is probably the earliest form of international law. But then how Europeans could claim these new lands they were finding is among the very earliest formulations of international law. And in fact, do you all know the fight that countries are engaged in today? You know that Russia planted its flag on the bottom of the Arctic Ocean in August of 2007? And do you know that China and Japan and Vietnam are arguing over the South China Sea? China stuck its flag on the bottom of the South China Sea in August of 2010. So maybe the doctrine of discovery is, is still alive today while we look for valuable resources at the bottom of the ocean. Anyway, sorry, I digressed there. So number five, what did tribes lose? They lost some of their sovereign powers. They lost some of their commercial rights. Because under the doctrine of discovery, Europeans presume and they claim that the law required discovered indigenous peoples to engage in trade and treaty making only with the country that had discovered it. This was the big fight in Brazil between Portugal, England, and Holland because the Dutch and the English wanted to trade along the coast of Brazil and the Portuguese were fighting them to keep them away. The Portuguese were saying, we own this part of the world under international law. You have to stay out. So even in the 1500s and the 1600s, these European countries understood the kind of claims, the legal rights they alleged to have acquired just because they were first discovered. Now, I'm on to element number six, contiguity. Well, how big of an area? All that word means is contiguous. How much land around where you walked ashore and stuck your flag across, how much land did Europeans claim? Well, they, of course, claimed enormous amounts of land. But for the most part, they claimed the drainage systems of rivers. So if I was there with you and had my PowerPoint slide, I would show you the Louisiana Territory. So picture that in your own mind. What is the Louisiana Territory? And I'm here where I am right now. What is, what is the Oregon country? Well, these territories were the drainage systems of rivers. And so for most European countries, it wasn't finding the headwaters of the river that was important. It was when they established a claim at the mouth of the river. In fact, when Thomas Jefferson made the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, he spent the summer of 1804 writing a 40-page pamphlet called The Limits and Boundaries of Louisiana. And he used his own library to track the European explorations down the Mississippi the establishment of towns like, say, uh, Genevieve, and then finally New Orleans. And so he was then trying to determine how big the drainage system of the Mississippi River was to determine how large the Louisiana Territory was. Don't forget what the Lewis and Clark expedition were doing, but they were not the only American expedition that Jefferson sent to try to find the parameters of the Louisiana Territory. Lieutenant Zebulon Pike was sent north on the Mississippi. He was also sent west on the Arkansas. And two guys named Dunbar and Scott were sent along the Red River through what is today Texas. So Jefferson was plainly using this contiguity principle, this element of the doctrine of discovery, to try to determine how big of an area of land he had claimed to have bought from France. So the Oregon country here is based on the drainage system of the Columbia River. Do you remember the James K. Polk slogan when he ran for president in 1844? I'll give a bonus point to anyone who knows. I don't see any hands. 54 forward or fight? Oh, yeah, yeah. What was he talking about? Today we don't even know. He was talking about the boundary of the Columbia River, the drainage system, which is clear almost up to Alaska, modern day Alaska. So he was willing to fight England over most of British Columbia because the United States claimed it due to Robert Gray finding the Columbia River in 1792 and naming it, Lewis and Clark traversing some of the Columbia River and settling at the mouth of the Columbia in 1805-1806, and then John Jacob Astor building the American fur trading post of Astoria at 
you guess the, the mouth of the Columbia River. So Thomas Jefferson and later presidents were claiming the United States owned the Oregon country. We didn't care what Russia said, we didn't care what Spain said, we didn't care what England said, and of course nobody was paying any attention to the indigenous nations. International law was only concerned with the Christian European slash American United States countries. But that's what continued. How big of an area could a European claim around where they had settled or what they had discovered? In fact, where many of you are, the colonies that uh, the English kings granted in 1620s, etc., granted the, the colonists 100 English miles around the specific colony they built. So that itself is a form of contiguity, a bigger claim than where you are actually occupying. Uh, number seven, Terra Mellis. I literally, before today, I was over reading a book uh, that I'm doing some work in. Terra Mellis is how Europeans consider the rest of the world. And there's two definitions for Terra Mellis. I mean, this is a Latin word for earth empty. So if land was completely empty and there were no human beings there, Gee, that's sort of like finders keepers, isn't it? I see money laying on the ground, I look around, I go, is this yours? Is this yours? Hey, yes, it's mine. So Europeans thought that if they found land that was completely empty, then they could claim it. So that's one aspect of terra nullis. Johnson B. McIntosh talks about that aspect. But Europeans also define terra nullis in a second way. They did this in Australia, they certainly did it in America, and in many parts of the world. Even if there were human beings there, as there were when James Cook landed near Sydney, Australia. You know, when he first went ashore and, and claimed the land for North for the English king, Aborigines was at him. So he ran back, jumped on the boat. Okay, we'll be back. We own this, but we'll be back. So that's the, the ridiculous claim of it. And they considered Australia to be empty. And for nearly 200 years, the English claim to Australia was based on terra nullis, that the land had been empty and devoid of peoples. The Australia Supreme Court reversed that decision in 1992 in a model, in a case that's called Mabo, Mabo versus the Queen. And that is an intriguing development for what we're talking about here, folks. Will the United States Supreme Court ever reverse Johnson v. McIntosh? Sure. I almost think no. But the Mabo decision gives me some belief that courts someday might say Johnson v. McIntosh was based on a lie and we can't consider, we cannot continue perpetuating a lie. And that is about exactly what the Australia Supreme Court said in 1992 in the Mabo case. Could you spell that? They said, we claim this country, we claim to own it because of terror. I gave that article up, but I was looking how the doctrine of discovery was applied in Africa. 
The Europeans, you may know this, divided Africa up in 1885 at the Berlin Conference, and they used several of these aspects of discovery that we're talking about now. So I was going to do that same research there. So the second element, the second definition of terra nullius is certainly what Europeans applied to Africa. They said those people are Christian, those people are civilized, and so we Europeans have the right to claim ownership, take assets, and as you know, the history of Africa, in some instances, was just horrific, even enslaved, torture, kill people, etc., to get economic assets. Uh, my last three uh, elements are to all start with a C. Uh, Christianity is what many of you are focusing on. The religion was a very significant aspect of what we call the doctrine of discovery today. Non-Christian peoples around the world do not presume to have the same rights as European Christians. We also know that non-white or non-European peoples were not presumed to have the same rights. In all these countries I've studied, religion was an enormous aspect of the alleged inferiority of the indigenous peoples, the alleged superiority of American and European peoples, and their alleged right then to dominate and control uh, and to take everything that they wish. Uh, Johnson B. McIntosh has a very funny phrase. I, I hope you are all really
Charles I, who was also Charles V, King of Spain. He gave lectures and wrote papers in 1530s about the Indians recently discovered. He wrote about the rights that Spain had acquired in the world. Indians are exceedingly important in the development of the doctrine of discovery, along with the actions that the church had taken in regards to the Canary Islands, etc. But it's De Vittoria who talks about the just war. He talks about the rights of Indian peoples, indigenous peoples as humans. They have the right to property, they have the right to sovereignty, but they must comply with European law or we can't attack them. And that's what he defined just war. Not just a war for defense, but a war for Christianity would be a, a, a just war under De Vittoria's definition. This, you're probably already thinking about the Crusades. And plainly, this kind of thinking does go back to the Crusades. And if you want to read it, another book that predates mine by Robert Williams about the Western, the American Indian and Western legal thought. He wrote that in 1990, and he traces the development of the doctrine of discovery in Europe and traces it at least to the Crusades of 1090 to 1250. And of course, if you want to focus on the Christianity aspect, uh, look at Steve Newcomb's book from 2008, uh, Pagans in the Promised Land. And if you have any money left over to buy books, buy mine. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> or Ruben, buy mine first. <laughs> then look at those other people. Anyway, so those are my 10 elements. And that comes from reading Johnson v. McIntosh over and over. And these are the elements of the Doctrine of Discovery. So if we are talking about doing about the Doctrine of Discovery, how can we undo paper balls from 1436, from 1453 and 4? I mean, what, what can we do? But if we see the ultimate results today, the laws, and the federal policies that come from the doctrine of discovery, then there are ways to attack its results and what it is still left today. And I would think that working with tribal nations, as you're working with the Onondaga Nation there, working with local Indian groups like the United Southern and Eastern Tribe, the National Congress of American Indians, what sort of policies and law legal changes our tribes working for. And so how can we get the doctrine of discovery out of the modern day lives of the Indian nations? Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob, that was great. Um, so can you take a few questions? Absolutely. Okay. Any questions? Quick, quick one, just. Uh, that book that you cited, American Indian and Western Legal Thought, could you say that again? Yes, that's the title. It's a 1990 book by Robert A. Williams, Jr. Thank you. And I think I cited you my two books at the bottom of the page. Yeah. The, the book that I wrote with uh, Jacinta Ruro and Tracy Barrett and, oh gosh, I'm blanking on the other person's name, but we really compared how the doctrine was applied in our four countries. Doctrine developed in Europe. I then wrote in my 2006 book about how it was brought to the United States and how it was applied here. Yes, sir? Uh, isn't, isn't there a unique cause with uh, the Holland Land Company, which is essentially a Holland Land Company uh, trying to assert some preemptive rights within, uh, for instance, the territory of the Haudenosaunee, New York State in particular. I, I think I understood your question. Are you literally talking in the 1640s? No, I'm talking about the Holland Land Company's uh, um, claim for, for having some preemption for the territories throughout New York State of the Iroquois, the Haudenosaunee. But I mean, do you mean today, or you're talking back when no, the I, I, I mean when, in 1640, 1640? No, I'm talking about in, in the 1700s still. I mean, the Holland Land Company was still acquiring 
uh, was trying to acquire property, did acquire, as did the Ogden Land Company, but the Holland Land Company was literally a Dutch company. So it was acquiring land throughout Onondaga, uh, Oneida, Seneca, Cuyuga Territory. So I just wonder uh, if you have any familiarity on what unique problem, because it seemed to me, I recall seeing where that was a, a major problem that, uh, you know, set, uh, that both the U.S. and, and were challenged by because because it was a foreign company. I'm unfamiliar with the specific company, but let me mention what I do write about in my book and what I do know, and maybe I have the date wrong. But the Dutch used my element number two, folks. So you have right in front of you when Holland and even Sweden had a colony in North America for a short while. And I thought it was in the 1640s to 1660s. The Dutch settled parts of New York, modern day New York, and parts of Pennsylvania, I believe in the 1640s to 1680s. And they used my element number two. They said, hey, to England, this spot is empty. Yeah, we see your colonies at Massachusetts Bay, we see your Plymouth colony, etc. But here's an enormous area of land that is empty. It's terra notice. You haven't occupied it. So we are going to go there. So the Dutch had cities, I mean, I suppose Manhattan, right? That was Dutch for a while. So I don't know exactly where the, the Dutch uh, colonies were, and I don't know the name that you're mentioning, sir, of this one company. But I think the Dutch were in North America for over 40 years before the English finally beat them in war and drove them out of the country. I do cite in my book several references and letters back and forth between Dutch and English officials, and they were arguing that element number two. The English were arguing contiguity. They were saying, you're too close to our other colonies. Yes, we're here. We have occupied it. You get out of here because we discovered it first. But the Dutch were arguing my element number two. You'll be stunned, folks, if you read of the arguments about the Pacific Northwest, where I am right now, between Russia, Spain, England, and the United States, they argued all these elements for 30, 40, 50 years while the debate was on about who owned the entire Oregon country, and then finally the U.S. and Canada agreed to draw the line where it is, or the U.S. and England agreed to draw the line where it is at the 49th parallel. So these elements, and the doctrine of discovery, is as well used and well known throughout uh, history. I think what was being under the, what a contention was that the a corporation set up under Holland's laws carried its claims over to the sovereignty which Britain claimed when the Duke of York conquered New Holland and then to the United States. So that that company still claimed its land claims even though the sovereignty in terms of the, 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 had gone from Holland to Britain to the United States. Okay, thank you. Yes, I'm just not familiar, that familiar with that. Something I've been studying, because my own tribe, we are studying our history. I'm from the Eastern Shawnee tribe, and we were in the Ohio and Western Pennsylvania area, and I've run across something called the West Connecticut Land Claim and a company out of Connecticut was claiming land way into what is modern day Ohio. So I think that, yes, you're right, it was a continuation of a claim. If you read Johnson v. McIntosh, it's the claim from the 17, uh, uh, I'm not blanking, it's a claim from 1773 and 1775 purchases by companies, English companies, of lands in what's now Illinois and Indiana. So Johnson v. McIntosh itself is a case similar to what you two gentlemen uh, was talking about. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, to what extent are either of these constitutional problems with doctrine of discovery, the reliance on religion, and which seems to conflict with the First Amendment, or the lack of recognition of personhood of the Indians, which kind of, kind of conflicts with the Fifth? The, the religious aspect I can speak of to where uh, the Supreme Court said about 20 years ago that we are a Christian Judeo country. You know, we like, you know, we have the flag salute in school, we sing the national anthem before baseball games, our money says in God we trust. Uh, there are a lot of religious principles tied to a lot of American history and policy. The United States gave land on reservations to churches if they would run schools. 
and then the United States said, well, you can run your church too. But you know, we have had this country that it has a mix of religion and, and politics and governance. And I, I don't know that the Supreme Court will put, I mean, right here to you, I will tell you, I do not think the United States Supreme Court will reverse Johnson v. McIntosh because the doctrine of discovery was based on papal rules. Now, I hope that, you know, that's my opinion. But our country allows, there was that new decision by the court last week, right, that allowed a city out in New England, I believe, to open their meetings with prayer. So I guess that's my answer to your first part. Now, I didn't quite catch the second part. You said because the doctrine of discovery ignores the personhood of Indians? Well, yes, we know that slaves were not treated as people, or the Chinese were not treated as people, or the slave, or you know, Irish were not treated as persons. And so uh, I assume the Indians were not treated as persons either. And yet the Constitution, the Fifth Amendment says no person shall, and then blah, blah, blah. It doesn't say no U.S. person. <laughs> Yes, because you know, for the longest time, uh, Indians were not considered uh, American citizens. My mother was born in 1923 in Oklahoma. She was not a citizen of the United States because she was an Indian. It wasn't until 1924 that all Indians were made uh, citizens of the U.S. I think, again, my opinion would have to be, again, that, well, that's an important point. You know, we, we did away with slavery never paid any kind of reparations, have they? So African Americans had to just move forward from when they were then given citizenship rights and recognized as human beings. I think the argument would be for American <coughs> Indians, okay, move forward. You know, at one time, maybe we called you savages, and at one time, we didn't think you were really human beings. But let's, you know, that's the past. Let's just move forward. So I don't, I don't know what sort of legal claim could be made. People have talked about reparations for American Indians. People have talked about reparations for uh, African Americans. Uh, the Chinese, the Japanese that we put in internment camps. I think the Japanese were finally given some reparations, but that took many decades, the Japanese that were put in the internment camps. So I don't know if, if that's going to undo the doctrine discovery. That's why I keep saying that I think my argument is look at the 10 elements of the doctrine, what did it create in law and policy, federal policy, and can it change those laws and those policies today? So that's really why I wanted to talk, and I'm glad Phil gave me time to talk. These elements are the concrete uh, uh, results of the doctrine of discovery, and maybe these are the concrete things we can attack. Thank you, Bob. So if we try to pressure Pope Francis to rescind papal bulls, is this worth it? Would that then collapse the legal system that we've used in the US? Simple answer, no. If the Pope of the Catholic Church reverses a papal bull from 500 years ago, that's not going to change how you own your house or how I own my house or what the speed limit is in the, you know. Is it worth pursuing? Absolutely. It would be one of the most worldwide and I would hope world-shaking educational moments that could possibly happen. So it is absolutely, you know, the work you're all doing in getting various church groups to repudiate and to understand this history and to educate themselves is the only way you change society, right? By education and by people understanding the injustices of the past. But what the Pope does today does not affect the law of the United States. I, I don't think that if I'm wrong, point that out to you, but he's not one of our congressmen, right? Or, or senators. And the, in fact, I think the Catholic Church, and Steve Newcomb has written about this, the Catholic Church claims they revoked those paper bulls in 1529 or something. You can find an article that Steve's written about that in Indian Country Today, I think. So, I think it's worth it, absolutely. Everything that you folks bring this to the, to the news, to the forefront, and for you to advocate and be a supporter of tribal positions is absolutely crucial. It's how you fix past injustices. 
I mean, we're still helping African Americans to bring their socioeconomic conditions up to an American average. American Indians are poorer by far than African Americans. American Indians suffer from the same socioeconomic groups as all oppressed groups. I mean, this is just what happens to oppressed groups in countries around the world. And indigenous peoples are almost always the lowest on the socioeconomic uh, sphere in any country. So this is why I'm encouraging working with tribes, working with tribal organizations. We're talking about law changes, and we're talking about policy changes on the federal government side. And that takes education and the support of 51% of the people. That's our democratic system. OK, well, thanks very much, Bob. Thanks again. Um, this was a tremendous talk. Um, all right. Thank you very much.